I'm James Kemp, president of the Jack Kemp Foundation, and it's a pleasure to be here in Buffalo uh, for the first oral history symposium uh, of the Kemp Oral History Project. Um, the Jack Kemp Foundation was founded in September of 2009, and uh, there isn't a better place to come than where Dad's uh, professional football career took off, uh, and we really appreciate the Buffalo Bills hosting us, um, and it's a perfect uh, lead into one of the major projects that we are embarking upon, the Kemp Leadership Academy, which will be a resource for current and former professional athletes who are interested in public policy and public service, seeking to follow in the footsteps of Jack Kemp, Bill Bradley, Steve Largent, J.C. Watts, and others who took their exploits on the fields of friendly strife uh, to ca the Capitol, um, where today as we always have, we need politicians who are passionate about serving their party best by serving their country first. We believe that that's one of the things that Jack Kemp, my father, did so well, uh, and we look forward to his inspiration continuing into future leaders, um, both from on the uh, fields of friendly strife and from other walks of life. Uh, it's a privilege to be here with the Buffalo Bills. We appreciate Mr. Wilson. Uh, and the whole Bills team who helped put this together and all of the participants uh, from Dad's Buffalo Bills career and his political career here in Buffalo throughout the years. Thank you. We are continuing our oral history program at Ralph Wilson Stadium, the home of the Buffalo Bills. Uh, co-sponsored by the Jack Kemp Foundation. Uh, this will be part of the Jack Kemp Legacy Project um, at, the, at the foundation. I'm Morton Kondracki. Uh, to begin, um, I'd like each of you to introduce yourself uh, and uh, just briefly explain what your connection with Jack Kemp was. Ambassador Joya. My name is Tony Joya. Uh, I've, I knew Jack when he was a congressman here. I was one of his uh, premier fundraisers and followed Jack's career through Congress and then also when he was at HUD and uh, stayed in touch with Jack and uh, were kind of kindred spirits in a lot of ways. Marie? I'm Marie Shattuck. I worked for Jack in his Buffalo congressional office from 1974 until uh, December of 1988 when he uh, closed the do office door for good. I was his executive assistant. I did a, a variety of uh, tasks and jobs for him. George? I'm George Borelli. I'm the over-the-hill political reporter for the Buffalo News, uh, who retired in 1992, and I covered all nine of Jack's uh, campaigns for the House. And I'm Ed Rutkowski, and uh, I was Jack's uh, former teammate with the Buffalo Bills, and I was his uh, district representative uh, from uh, 1970 to 1978, and good friend and looked upon Jack as an older brother. Um, let me uh, start out by just throwing a question, a general question to each one of you, Ed, first. Um, uh, wh what words come to mind when you think about what kind of a congressman Jack Kemp was? Uh, I'll tell you a little story that he told me, uh, which was uh, reminiscent of uh, what I think he represented. He once told me a story about the uh, Duke of uh, Mantua, and uh, the Duke was uh, noted for his leadership ability. And they once found the Duke, and they asked him, uh, what is the most important quality in a leader? And the Duke answered uh, in two words, "Essere umano, to be human. And that reminded me of Jack, because he never had a mean bone in his body. Uh, there is a, a decent way of saying no to somebody without being sarcastic or nasty. And uh, Jack always thought that you beat people with the competition of ideas. Uh, you, you don't make it personal. You don't make it negative. You try to have better ideas than the other person, and hopefully you can convince uh, those people that your ideas are better, and hopefully they vote for you. George? Uh, Jack was very passionate, and I, I was always impressed by the fact that he was a, a jock, a physical education major at Occidental College in California, who pretty much on his own became an intellectual and a and an expert on economic affairs. That, that really caught my attention. Right? He was fair. He was very fair. He treated everyone 
equally, and he, uh, his caring was very evident in dealing with the, uh, every constituent that he ever came across, he, he always was very caring and, and actually was concerned about their issues and their problems. Does, uh, does any uh, particular piece of constituent service stand out in your memory? We used to have town hall meetings. We'd go out to a different town in our district and, and we'd send out flyers so everybody knew he was going to be there a certain time and, and place. And, and uh, people would just come. And, and no matter how many people came, he sat and he talked to everyone individually, one at a time. And he, they, some had problems that we resolved or we would follow up and resolve. Others just wanted to talk to him or let him hear their opinion on things. And, and it was a grueling day uh, because we get over 100 people uh, oftentimes. And he would just sit there and go and listen. And the first person felt his caring as much as the last person of the day. Mm -hmm. Tony? I was so impressed with Jack being always so positive, always so upbeat. And compared to the partisan politics you see today, that just wasn't Jack's style at all. He was never nasty to anybody. He would never try to attack anybody. He'd always try to talk about the positive aspect of his ideas without trying to in any way detract from the other person. We really miss that today, and I think that uh, in Jack's passing, I think that was brought up, uh, and we don't have that kind of discourse anymore. Right. Mort, uh, let me interrupt a second. Sure. Uh, um, when Jack first uh, became congressman, his office was located in downtown Buffalo in the, the federal building, yet his district was basically the suburbs. And he was very upset because uh, when they talked to people, they, they'd say, you know, we don't really get into downtown Buffalo. We don't know how to park. We don't know how to get to your office. So he decided that let's go out to the people. We decided, as Marie has said, to have these uh, constituent meetings. We would send out notices in advance. We'd go to uh, Town Hall, and we'd go to Williamsville and Amherst, Cheektowaga, Hamburg, yeah. and uh, take our, our staff with us so that they can provide on-the-spot uh, service to the uh, constituents. And, the, and, and they loved it. And it was a good way of campaigning because Someone once told us for uh, every individual can have a profound influence, negative or positive, about on 20 people. Uh, you know, your immediate family, friends, uh, the gas station attendant, your butcher, your, the, 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 the mailman. But I re do, do recall once we were having a constituent meeting out in Cheektowaga, which is a heavy Democratic district, and we took all our staff out there. And uh, we started about 9 in the morning and uh, went to about 4 in the afternoon. And we went through about 35 or 36 uh, uh, people. And, and we tried to get some idea in advance as to what the problem of that particular person was. So Jack had some kind of a clue before they came in to talk to him. There was one lady who didn't want to tell any of us what the problem was. Uh, and you could tell that she was very distressed. But she did want to meet Jack. And she was the last lady to go in and meet with Jack. And I tried to pry it out of her, and, and she wouldn't tell me. So finally, at about 4.30 in the afternoon, when we're all almost exhausted, I brought the lady in. And uh, the, the, the scenario was Jack was on my left. I was sitting here. We had some uh, staff workers on both sides. And, and the lady or the person would sit there. And uh, I brought her in. I sat there uh, over there. And I said, Jack, this is a Mrs. Uh, Smith, for example. Uh, she wants to talk to you about uh, the problem that she's having. And Jack looked her at her and he said, uh, and Mrs. Smith, uh, what's your problem? How can I help you? And she said, uh, they're, they're after me. They're watching me. <laughs> and he said, who, who? And she's sitting there and she points over up into the air and she said, they are. And both Jack and I turned around <laughs> and looked up in the air and then our eyes met. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> and we yeah. knew that uh, we that had was a, a problem you couldn't solve. We had to yeah. call her family for some psychiatric yeah. problems, right? Yeah. Uh, well, Ed, how did Jack decide that he was going to run for Congress? He decided uh, uh, during his playing days in uh, professional football. Uh, uh, Jack and I both lived in Hamburg. Uh, we would travel to practice uh, uh, together. And during the off season, uh, he was very politically involved. Uh, he helped uh, uh, with the Goldwater campaign. Uh, he helped. Uh, I'm trying to think of the uh, editor of the San Diego paper, who was a good friend oh, of his. Oh, Her Herb Klein. Herb Klein, oh, yeah. yes. And he wrote uh, some articles for the paper. And he knew eventually that he wanted to get involved in politics. And so he prepped himself during the off season for that. And. Uh, 
and we had a, a lot of interesting dialogues. And, you know, I told him, hell, I was a, a kid from the coal mines of Pennsylvania. I never knew what a, de a Republican was until I met Jack Kemp. You know, we were all Democrats. <laughs> And uh, uh, he started to uh, talk to me about his position and everything. And eventually he said that, uh, uh, you know, when I do retire and run, I want you to help me uh, in my campaign. And I said I'd be more than happy and thrilled to do that for you. And, uh, so that's how we became friends and I became involved with Jack. So how does this uh, Max uh, McCarthy, who was the sitting congressman in the district, decided to run for the Senate? And did Jack immediately decide that he was going to take Go for that seat. Well, there was, George, maybe you can help on this uh, with, with McCarthy. He was in and out as to whether or not he wanted I, to do I, I think Jack uh, had decided to run for Congress before McCarthy decided to run statewide. Uh, uh, Richard Max McCarthy was the three-term incumbent in that district, very popular, mm -hmm. very good campaigner. And he decided, uh, much to his regret, to run statewide for the Democratic nomination for the U.S. Senate, Senate. and uh, he lost. I think Jack had already been endorsed by that time. I'm not yes, sure. Yes, I I'm think he certain. was. But anyway, McCarthy lost. Uh, he lost to a New York City Democrat who uh, lost also. In fact, that was the year Jim Buckley was elected to the U.S. Senate on the conservative line. So. Uh, uh, McCarthy, after he lost the statewide primary, he tried to uh, persuade the, de the Democratic candidate for that congressional seat to accept the Supreme Court nomination so McCarthy could reclaim the line for the, the, the congressional seat. But Tom Flaherty, Tom Flaherty was his name, and he refused. And uh, of course, Jack became the nominee against Flaherty, and he was in the right place at the right time because he barely won that election. But he would have run against uh, McCarthy had McCarthy stayed in his seat? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, he would have. Yeah, and, and, and you're right. That was no, uh, no easy election. Uh, Tom, uh, uh, Tom uh, uh, Flaherty, Flaherty uh, was a widower, uh, very articulate, yeah. uh, an Irish Catholic from South Buffalo, right. uh, had, had four kids, and... and uh, very well spoken, highly regarded, and uh, here was Jack, this uh, young whippersnapper who had played professional football, and people were saying, you know, we, we recognize the name Jack Kemp, but you know, no. what the hell does a football player think he's doing running for Congress? So we had, to, we had our job cut out for us because we had to get no. him out into the uh, 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 throws of uh, uh, the people of Erie County and show that he could, uh, you know, chew gum and walk at the same time, but articulate the issues. And we started putting together a lot of these coffee clatches, and that's how the wives became involved. You know, invite about 10 or 15 of your friends and neighbors. We also had the Conservative Party endorsement, which put them over the top. And the Republican Democratic head-to-head, uh, -head, Flaherty beat uh, Jack, but Jack got, I think, 14,000 votes on the conservative line. Which was the margin and of victory? He ended up winning by about 6,000 votes. Yeah, it was only 51 to... Uh, so 49 to 50, yeah. Yeah, 51.6 to 48.4, yeah. yeah. <laughs> as a matter of fact. Very Tony, <clears throat> so what do you remember about that campaign? Uh, I was just getting involved in politics at the time, but I remember, obviously, I knew Jack. I was an <clears throat> avid Buffalo Bills football fan. But when people used to criticize Jack because he was just a football player, he used to say, yeah, but I was the quarterback. <laughs> so, and we used to call our own plays. So, yeah. so he usually had that argument pretty well uh, set. But I think that... that um, I, I expected Jack to win, and uh, you, you know he had uh, name recognition not just locally but certainly you know on a national basis. So we expected big things from Jack uh, when he uh, joined Congress. And I remember um, I was in the pasta business at the time, and we used to have these meetings in Washington once a year, uh, and you were allowed to invite your congressman. So I thought, what the heck, I'll invite Jack. I never expected that Jack would actually come because he was a superstar as far as I was concerned. But sure enough, Jack showed up at this luncheon. And all the other congressmen were deferring to Jack. And this was when he was relatively new in, new in Congress. And all the other people in the pasta business were just starstruck by the fact that Jack Kemp came to this luncheon. It really made the luncheon a hit. Yeah. So uh, uh, that was really the beginning of my involvement with uh, Jack on a regular basis because he, he took the time to come to uh, spend time with us. At a, you know, and the pasta business was not exactly the 
growth industry of the world at the time. Right, uh, George. So, tell me about the uh, the demography and the political character of the district. Was it a, a union uh, um, democratic district? I mean, if, if McCarthy had had it for three terms, yeah, that... it, it, it was uh, de democratic, but mm -hmm. I don't think by by a whole lot. McCarthy was a liberal Democrat, but he was uh, he had a lot of support among moderate Republicans. Uh, that, that's an extinct uh, group now, moderate Republicans, mm -hmm. uh, a la Nelson Rockefeller and Jake Javits. But he, he had a lot of support among uh, moderate Republicans, and he had uh, uh, the Democratic uh, Party, which was very powerful at the time and most of organized labor, but not all of it. Jack uh, made inroads with organized labor. How did, how did Jack, uh, was it because he was the uh, president of the Players Association that he could appeal to union voters? Yes, uh, I, I think that was part of it. We had a, a very interesting uh, campaign strategy. Uh, Ted Dulski, who was uh, a Democratic congressman, uh, thought so highly of Jack, even though Jack uh, was a Republican, he put a very nice article in the congressional record, and it had the congressional seal, and it had uh, all these nice things about Jack, what he had, what he had done uh, in football and also uh, uh, in his exploits off the field. So we took that uh, page out of the congressional record, and we printed on the back of the page, can a union leader ever be elected to Congress? And, and we had uh, oh. thousands of those, and we went down to the uh, gates at Bethlehem Steel when they were having the shift change at 6.30 in the morning, and we passed these things out and just drove the Democrats crazy. But uh, they realized that uh, we had a, a person of substance. And Jack's cute line when he was running, uh, somebody said, well, how do you expect to get elected to uh, Congress uh, being a football player? And his line was, uh, well, I'm going to tell the people of Erie County if they don't elect me to Congress, I'm going to have to go back and play for the <laughs> Buffalo Bills. So said, that should assure my election. There's an interesting sidelight to that labor connection with uh, Jack Kemp. Uh, I think it was in 84 or 86 when <clears throat> Jack was to appear before the Erie County Republican Executive Committee to be routinely re-endorsed for re-election. And uh, the meeting was at the Statler Hotel in downtown Buffalo. And the hotel was being picketed. Jack would not cross the picket line. So the executive committee had to move out to Delaware Avenue, a main thoroughfare, downtown Buffalo. And they held an outdoor meeting and endorsed Jack. Do you remember that? Yeah. Uh, uh, Ed, what, what were the issues of the campaign? What what was the campaign about? It was about jobs, <clears throat> uh, entrepreneurial uh, activity, creating jobs, reducing taxes. Uh, the tax burden on the citizens of Erie County uh, was too high, uh, and the tax burden from the uh, state of New York. And, and, and when you talk about uh, uh, labor, I remember when uh, uh, Reagan was running for uh, the presidency, and we had this luncheon out in uh, Route 5. There was a restaurant out there, and labor uh, was going to picket it. And they had uh, uh, George Wessel and some of the other labor leaders across the street uh, forming a picket line. And uh, R Ronald Reagan and Jack and I and, and some of his supporters were in the restaurant. And uh, Reagan said, it, those guys, you know, want to send them some coffee and donuts. So Jack, uh, you know, got coffee and donuts on the trade, took it over to them. And these guys, you know, they just loved them for doing that. They couldn't believe that, uh, you know, he had that kind of a relationship <coughs> with uh, labor, but he had some uh, pretty good yeah. labor support from some the of the Building trades people, yeah. people really loved the right. Jack. Uh, got along well with them. I, I recall one year, <clears throat> I think it was the year Jack was running for president, the, uh, the president of the International Longshoremen Union came here to uh, speak on Jack's behalf. I remember that. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was out your way in Hamburg or... Yeah. So, uh, so he gets elected to, to Congress. Uh, what, were, what were the marching orders for the district office? Well, the, in, because Jack had to be in Washington for much of the week, we were, uh, he had entrusted us with being his face 
his eyes and ears uh, in the district as to what issues were up, what, what problems were up, what uh, feedback we would be getting from the constituents. And, uh, and we would always act as if Jack were standing behind us saying, you know, you, this is how I would handle it. And so you followed suit. So it was pretty much um, just to maintain uh, the eyes and the ears in the district uh, on his behalf and, and, uh, and feed him all that information that he was unable to because he was in Washington. Mm -hmm. um, what was the connection between the district office and the Washington office? What, what kind of byplay was there? There was uh, there was some differences because they, uh, for the most part, um, the people weren't from the Buffalo area. Uh, there were some staffers that were uh, originally, uh, and and Washington reacts a little differently to things than we do. So we would keep them grounded as to what was going on, and and I'm dating myself, but this was before cell phones, and I remember getting the first fax in the fax machine because every morning we'd have to read the newspaper right. articles to him over Same the phone. Yeah. And then when we got a fax machine, this was like heaven sent. We would yeah. be able to fax them because then we would have to quickly mail them off. Uh, and so, so uh, uh, he wanted to keep abreast of what was happening and, uh, and that was uh, our purpose there as well. Yeah. We had our issues at times. Uh, a couple yeah. times uh, I, I couldn't get the Washington staff during the day. So the next day I'd call and say, Yo, Nobody answered the phone. He said, well, it snowed here. Oh, I yeah. said, oh, really? How yeah. much? He said, half inch. I said, a half inch? <laughs> we call that a dusting in yeah. Buffalo. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Unbelievable. But so then, were yeah. there any other issues with the Washington office besides there not being there during a snowstorm? No. Well, I think uh, you know, uh, Jack prided himself on constituent work, mm -hmm. working on behalf of the constituents. And we had a great staff, and uh, yeah. uh, people just threw their heart and soul into uh, these constituent matters. Yeah. And, uh, and, and they say the best advertising is word of mouth advertising. And I think that really helped him because they knew that if you went to Jack Kemp, uh, you can get your problem resolved most of the time. Or get some action. Yeah. And, and Jack had great loyalty to his staff as well, yes. I remember, yes. through all the people that he had working for him. He really uh, treated them with respect and uh, uh, they were always held in high regard by Jack. And therefore, I think uh, all the uh, voters felt the same way about mm -hmm. you know, Jack's staff as well. Jack had the uh, yeah. ability to hire people that fit in to the family because his, his, his staff was also his family as his football players and his real family. They, we were also a family and we all worked towards uh, the same end and, and Jack set as a leader, he set that tone. How, so. how, di how did he manage to make people into family? Is there a he, he, he said uh, always, you, you put your country before your party. Uh, and that's why I think he got along so well with, uh, you know, Henry Nowak, who was a mm -hmm. congressman, John LaFalse, who was a congressman. Even though they were Democrats, they worked hand in hand with Jack, who was a Republican. And I think people respected that mm -hmm. and admired him for it, that he wasn't petty or vindictive or negative about it. And, and, and that uh, uh, made a lot of people happy. So how often, how often did he come back to the district? He tried to come back as often mm. as he could, but uh, uh, the good thing about it was that I became a surrogate for him, and uh, we both came off uh, football careers. So uh, if everybody wanted Jack to speak at a dinner, but if Jack wasn't available because he was in Washington, they'd take Edward Kowski because Ed, mm -hmm. you know, was kind of a star somewhat in uh, the uh, football arena. So I'd go out and speak on Jack's behalf. And to some extent, that's how I developed a political base of my own, by going out and speaking on Jack's behalf. But he would try to come back just about every weekend mm -hmm. to uh, you know, have constituent meetings and meet with, uh, with uh, people. Mm -hmm. Jack was also a national figure, so that took a lot of his time. And as a national leader of the Republican Party, there, was a, there were a lot of demands on Jack's time on weekends. And sometimes our friend at the news used to, not, not George, but the news used to <laughs> occasionally criticize Jack as not spending enough time in the district. And I would argue with them saying, look, Jack doesn't need to spend the time here because he's a national figure. It's almost a contradiction. If you're spending all of your time in Buffalo, you don't have the, the clout that Jack had, and he didn't need to spend as much time here. And it isn't fun getting up at 5 o'clock on a mm -hmm. Saturday morning to travel to Cleveland or to travel to Iowa to you know, help a congressman that's uh, running for re-election or in a tough race. And Jack did that, but as a result, he had a lot of clout. So when Jack wanted something done, he had the juice to get it done where a lot of other people wouldn't. 
And I think this was one of the real contradictions that they had to deal with. In now, defense, uh, in defense yeah, the, of the Buffalo News, uh, <laughs> the Buffalo News was very good to Jack. My recollection is they endorsed him every time he ran mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. for the House. Now, he, he, goes, he goes from a 51% victory <clears throat> to uh, uh, 70s and, in one case, 90% yeah. victory. But uh, in, the, uh, in the 86 race, he went, he, in 84, he got 75% uh, of the vote. In 86, he got 57.5% of the vote. He dropped almost, almost 20 points. What happened in 1986? Well, you, you were, I, you were I, gone, but... No. but I can tell you. Okay, what happened? Uh, in, 80, in 86... Uh, that that, that that was to be Jack's last election for Congress because he was preparing to run for president. And everybody and, knew and it. They, yeah, and they set high expectations. They wanted him to win by 15 or 20 points. Well, his Demo Democratic opponent turned out to be a young, aggressive, well-known Democrat named James Kane, who was the majority leader of the Common Council. And he waged a very aggressive campaign. But Jack won by 11 or 12 points, and a lot of politicians would give their right arm to win by 11 or 12 points. But because the expectations originally were so high, some people interpreted it as a slap at Jack. Well, did anybody in the district think that he was spending too much time away from the district and wasn't you know, attentive well, enough because he was a national pop. I think uh, uh, his a Democratic opponent made reference to that during the campaign, but still, if you win by 10, 11, 12 points, uh, that's not a bad victory margin. Um, there, there was one uh, race in which, or I guess maybe more than one race, in which his opponents charged that he didn't live in the district, that his that he was actually a resident of, of Bethesda, Maryland, and and said that his the official residence that he was listing was his treasurer's house. Now, was there any truth to that? I mean, did he maintain a residence here? He, he did he have always, a residence he in uh, Hamburg. Mm -hmm. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. He okay. always had a residence here. Okay. Um, so, um, he he was 18 years in Congress. Did did his attitude as Tony mentioned change over time, his, his presence change over that period of time? Did it, were there certain periods of different kind of activity toward the district? In the beginning, presumably he was here every weekend. Did, did that change over time? Yeah, he got more passionate. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't, I don't know at uh, Jack's uh, service in Washington uh, when he passed away, whether it was uh, Jimmy or uh, Jeff, but he got up and said, you know, my dad's passion was passion. And I recall vividly when uh, uh, he came back on a weekend, he was so excited. He was in our living room standing by the fireplace. He said, Eddie, I've got this, this, this great bill that I'm, I'm, I'm going to introduce. It's called the Jobs Creation Act. And we're going to cut tax rates, and it's going to stimulate the economy. It's going to create jobs, and it's going to get this area out of the doldrums, and, and we're, we're, we're going to go forward. And that morphed into Kemp Roth, which morphed into the tax cut proposal that he uh, initiated with Ronnie Reagan, right. who Reagan adopted, who then convinced Maggie Thatcher to adopt. So he had a profound effect on the economy, not only here, but worldwide. And Absolutely it was because right. of his mm -hmm. passion no question about that. in doing that. And, yeah, the and Camp uh, Roth bill uh, <clears throat> originally called for a 27 percent across the board tax uh, cut and uh, Ronald Reagan adopted the, the guts of that plan for his 1980 campaign, which, of course, he won. And eventually, I think, the first year in the Reagan administration, the Congress passed uh, a cross-the-board tax cut of 23 percent, which was, at the time, the largest uh, tax cut ever, ever enacted. And Jack was really the primary guy behind that. Uh, let me let me bring it back to Buffalo for a second. Um, what did he do for the economy of, of of the district and the Buffalo area? He got people thinking uh, about how heavily they were being taxed, and, and and his premise was, 
He was kind of an educator, too. Uh, uh, he based his tax cuts on, on, on what Kennedy did in the early 60s. Kennedy cut the tax rates, the economy took off, and he said, this is what my Jobs Creation Act is predicated upon. And he was a student of history, a student of economics, as George said, you know, he taught himself well. And uh, he said, uh, and it drives my Democratic friends crazy because when they asked me, uh, Kemp, you're crazy. He said, I'm not crazy. I took it from one of your guys. And they said, who? He said, President Kennedy. He said, I'm doing what your, your guy did. And uh, we had a lot of fun with that. And uh, Incidentally, they had the same uh, initial JFK. JFK. Yeah. 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 Right. So, I mean, but uh, did, he, did he bring home bacon for the district? I mean, yes. A lot mm -hmm. of the around, you know. Yeah, I think that Jack was philosophically opposed to earmarks, and he said so publicly, but he said, as long as they're going to be there, I'm going to bring mine home you know, from my district. He said, as long as they're going to be earmarks, we're going to get them. I'm, I'm opposed to it philosophically, but if they're going to be there, I'm going to see that Western New York gets, gets our fair yeah. share. And he, he did. Worked, he worked with uh, Henry Nowak and John LaFalls for the mm -hmm. light rail rapid transit uh, funding. Right. Rapid transit. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah, and that was, uh, uh, which brought a lot of uh, federal funds into uh, Buffalo. Mm -hmm. And so he was not exactly a small government conservative. I would say, yes, he was, but to the extent that if he, he could do something that could improve the economic base of Buffalo, he would, uh, he would uh, be for it. He always told people, he said, look, I want to I cut your taxes. I want to get your tax rates. I want to give you more of your money back so you can spend it the way you want to spend it, not the way the people in uh, Washington tell, tell you how to spend the money. He said, I would put my trust and faith in the first 25 people in the Buffalo uh, phone book than in the Council of Economic Advisors. He said, if, if, if we cut your tax rates and you get more money back, you do one of three things. He said, one, you spend it, which stimulates the economy, or two, you invest it, which helps companies grow, or three, you save and it goes into a pool of capital from which uh, uh, businesses can borrow. And, 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 and those ideas, that concept, cut across party lines. That's why he got such good support from Democrats as well as uh, Republicans. Um, was there was there ever any tension in your relationship with Jack? There was a, there's a memo in the files that's uh, about uh, one of the campaigns that says uh, to avoid any further strains in the Jack Eddy relationship, which is uh, uh, currently very intense. Do you remember what that was about? Seventy four or something? No, I, I don't. We've <laughs> always had, we always had a good relationship, and I always made sure that. Uh, 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 I treated him with the utmost respect, but if he wanted to start talking about being a buddy buddy and football friend and stuff like that, uh, I, I would then take the lead. But I, I always let him make the, uh, the lead on that. We had our differences. Uh, um, um, sometimes he would be a, a bit aggressive when he. <laughs> when it came to driving. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, yeah, tell us about that. <laughs> uh, and he was, he was almost always late leaving a meeting and uh, wanted always. to make the plane on time. And, 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 and I was the driver trying to get him to the airport on time. And I, I, I remember vividly, he would step on my uh, uh, foot, you know, on the gas pedal. Push the gas pedal down. Uh, push the gas pedal down. Uh, we, 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 and if we got stopped by the police, uh, he, as the, the officer was coming, he said, tell him I'll get him an autograph football. Tell him I've got to get to the airport. And we had one situation where we were so far behind in our schedule, uh, trying to get out to the airport, got up to a stoplight, and there was a car in front of me. He said, go around the car, go around the car. I said, Jack, I, he, he said, go around the car. I said, you want to drive? He said, yeah. So I said, all right. I got up under the car, and they went, and he came, and I got in the passenger side. He pulled the car up on the sidewalk, went across uh, the road because there weren't any cars coming, and cut in front of the other cars, and, and he got us out to the airport with about a minute to spare. But I'm, I'm telling you, okay. Joanne summed it up uh, succinctly. She said, for a guy who didn't obey the, the rules of the road, he was a pretty good driver. Because he, <laughs> he used to really drive with his it. right and left foot. He put his left foot yeah. on, the, on the brake and his yeah. right foot on the oh. gas pedal. But we've got tons of stories about driving. driving. He was, um, uh, we were, he was addressing the uh, Rotary Club in Williamsville. And I'm in the back of the room telling him he's got to catch a plane. He has no more time left. He has to leave right now. But he was answering questions, and he was still there and still there. And I literally had to walk up and, and guide him out. So now we're very behind, and we had to get to the airport quickly. And um, uh, I, I called ahead to the airport, uh, to the passenger uh, service, uh, and told him, we're coming, don't give his seat away. But then um, we had uh, 
um, Bob Blaney had an accident with the car in the parking lot. And so I, I was the only one that had the vehicle. And at the time, I just had this little RX-7, a two-seater car. It was teeny. And so I had to take him to the airport. And he got in the car barely, because he didn't fit. And, <laughs> and we got to the, um, uh, the first red light. And he's yelling for me to go through the red light so we can get to the airport. I said, no, I'm not going through the red light. And then he put a. Uh, uh, magazine over his face because there were people waiting to cross it. <laughs> he didn't want them to see him in the car. And uh, he did the same thing. It was, it was a stop sign. He said, go around them. I said, I can't go around. There's a car there. He goes, no, go around the other way. And that meant going in oncoming traffic to get ahead of the guy. So, um, but uh, unlike today, he could come to get to the airport uh, in the five minutes before the plane uh, shut the door and, and uh, he could get right on. Yeah, no security in those no days. No security. That's right, yeah. So were there any other foibles? Uh, yeah, yeah the, we were going out to Ken Lipke's house for a fundraiser, <laughs> and uh, it was at night, and mm -hmm. I was in the car with Mary Lou and, and Jack, and, and we're, we're going along the road. He said, turn up there, turn, turn. I said, turn, and he grabbed the steering wheel. So I turned, and we went into this big clump of bushes, and it stopped, and I said, you satisfied, Jack? He said, I swear there was a road there, and he said, I swear there was a road. <laughs> I said, I'm so sorry. <laughs> but he would literally grab the steering wheel. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, the, uh, he insisted on driving my car one day, and I got in the back seat, and Joanne and Jack were in the front seat, and my garage door opener fell off the visor when he pushed it down, and so he took the garage door opener, and he just threw it in the back seat, and it hit me in the head, and <laughs> Joanne's going, Jack, you hit her, and he goes, oh, did I, did I, and he was just so intent on getting to the airport on time. When, but, yeah, when, when he had a, a place to go, we had a situation where the Republican Party uh, wanted him to come back, uh, and this was after uh, his congressional days, to speak at a, a Lincoln Day dinner. It was in uh, February. And he had a, um, a, uh, an engagement the next day in Chicago. He had to speak at a breakfast meeting. Uh, and he very much wanted to honor uh, their, their request to speak at the uh, Lincoln Day dinner at night. So I had a friend of ours, uh, Jerry Bukite, who uh, has his own company and he's got his own uh, uh, plane. plane. He's got a jet and he's a pilot. So I called Jerry and I said, you know, got a little problem. I said, you know, Jack wants to do this, but we got to get him to Chicago the next uh, morning. Could you, could you fly him? He said, oh, I'd love to, you know. So I pick up uh, 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 Jack and we go to the uh, dinner and he speaks at the dinner and Jerry's at the dinner and Jerry gets in the car with uh, Jack and myself and I drive to the airport. And it's, now it's 10.30 at night, and uh, getting out of the car, and uh, you hear the car door uh, slam, and, and I hear, open the door, open the door, open the door, and the door opens, and there's Jerry shaking his hand like that. And I said, Jerry, what happened? He said, Jack, he slammed the door on my fingers. And I said, let me see him. And I said, geez, I'm going to have to take you to the emergency room or something. And Jack said, oh, no, 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 he's all right. He said, he, he's okay. <laughs> I said, Jack, he's the pilot. He said, no, 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 he's okay, look. He's a <laughs> And Jerry flew him to Chicago that night and turned around that night and flew him back. And the, the joke is, now every time Jerry you would see me, he said, where's that Kemp? I want to sue him. He said, he never <laughs> well, As you know, he was an, uh, just an incredible reader. He would read several newspapers every day. But his, his uh, style of reading newspapers was literally read a page and toss it. And so he'd end up in a, just, a, just a surrounded by a heap of newspapers. Well, he did the same thing in the car while we were driving. And he never liked to drive more than 20 minutes at a crack. So uh, you'd always tell him, it, it's just going to take 20 minutes to get there, even though it was longer. But you'd have to clean out the car with a shovel by the time <laughs> you got there because there were Dorito bags and, and uh, newspapers and magazines and, and uh, just strewn about. What did his office look like? Uh, about the same. They were stacks of oh, yeah. newspapers, yeah. and and he all over. He had an incredible memory. He would read uh, something and and retain it. It was just remarkable. Amazed me. And people's names, he would remember. Oh, his his memory for names was phenomenal. Oh, it was he, he incredible. Just, he had a photographic memory. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if he wrote it down, he could remember it. And his, uh, he had three three uh, elements of uh, things. You know, the the most important stuff he put in his. Uh, Mm -hmm. pocket and then the other stuff in his two pockets and then 
he had a folder, and I can't tell you how many times he lost the folder, but, you know, he would yeah. always pull out the, uh, the the vest pocket stuff first and then give it to us mm -hmm. and, you know, follow up and there's some follow up and that and here and this, or give you a napkin with somebody's name and a phone number scribbled on it. So. Let me tell you one qu uh, quick story. There was one time when Jack was speaking at the Naval Academy to the mm -hmm. entire uh, uh, Corps of Midshipmen, so it was like 4,000. And he brought uh, Joanne and Judith was with him. Judith was a teenager. She's a very beautiful girl, blonde girl. So they're on the stage, and, uh, and this was the only time I saw Jack blush was when they introduced, when he introduced jo uh, Judith, all of the young midshipmen started whistling, and, <laughs> and Jack didn't know what to say. He was speechless, and his cheeks got very red. And and uh, but there were um, microphones in each of the aisles so that the uh, cadets could come down and, and ask Jack a question. And and uh, was one uh, cadet asked him about a Department of Defense uh, report and something specific in that report, and Jack answered him and. Afterward, I was talking to uh, the staff person who worked defense, and she said, I can't believe he knew the answer to that because I handed him that report, and he just literally paged it and never touched it again. But he, he retained what he, wrote, what he had written. Hmm. Um, why did he not run in 1980 for the, for the U.S. Senate, Ed? I think, uh, as, as hmm. I said before, Jack's passion was passion, and... Uh, not only for the Senate, but uh, we tried to get him to run for governor. Right. Uh, what year was that? Uh, don't too many concussions, more <laughs> than. But, uh, but uh, one of the problems was that he he was so committed to the cause, the tax cut cause, that he felt that if he left the halls of Congress for any other position, that nobody would be able to fill that vacuum the way he filled it. And I think he proved himself right that, uh, you know, went from a Jobs Creation Act to Kemp Roth to the Reagan tax cuts. And uh, he just didn't feel that there was anybody who was as committed or as passionate about that cause that he was. There's a lot of talk about the Reagan Revolution, obviously, but Jack Kemp provided the ammunition for the Reagan Revolution. Clearly, I don't think Jack gets nearly enough credit for that. I mean, you, you hear it talked about sometime, but uh, not as often as it should be. I mean... Ronald Reagan adapted Jack Kemp's ideas, and they became very, very successful, and that led to the Reagan Revolution. But he, he conceivably could have done it from the Senate if he'd run against Jacob Javits, <clears throat> who, after all, had, had been diagnosed with ALS and right. was you know, n not going to make it through his next term. So the seat was available. Why didn't, why didn't he run, do you think? I think he was too uh, politically astute. Uh, Jack, Jack was an upstater not that well known in New York City and the, 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 the overlay was about at that time three to two uh, Democratic and statewide Democratic uh, politics can be pr pretty vicious at times and I, I think he made the right decision by not, not running statewide. I think but yeah, that a lot was of the year that El won though. So yeah, yeah, was, did yes. win. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, but he was from Long Island. Yeah. Now, Jack, could, do you Jack think Jack, could Jack have beaten Alphonse D'Amato in the primary? Uh, possibly, but uh, uh, D'Amato was a New York City area guy and very, very, very much better known than Jack was in the metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. uh, upstaters uh, don't get too much attention in New York City. Um, so, how, how, what happened? How, how did he decide to run for president in 88? What you you must have been there, Ed, d during the thought process. He decides not to not to continue being a congressman. He decides that he's going to run for president. What? what? Well, I, I, it, it it wasn't me or anybody locally prodding him to do mm -hmm. that. I think he had a lot of national support, and people thought that uh, he was ready for that kind of a stage. And they for quite some time too. It wasn't yeah. just this wasn't just some whim at the moment. I mean, we all knew that that if not Jack, certainly his supporters were pushing him in that direction for years. He would have these parties with bringing national people in to go to the Super Bowl games. That We had people from all over the country who were Jack supporters who really admired Jack, what he had done. So this was going on for a long time. Mm -hmm. so it was and not were, were you involved in the, in the national yes. fundraising effort yes. for 88? Uh, yes. 
Mm -hmm. In fact, I hosted the dinner we had that announced it at the old executive hotel. Remember that mm -hmm. 727 came in and right. Newt Gingrich was on the plane, yeah. among mm -hmm. others. Right. And uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I was, I sat right next to Lou Saban, between Lou Saban, I think, and Jack. And uh, so it was a, that was a great time. And w why do you think he didn't do better in 88 than he did? Um, it's really hard to say. I think obviously you had uh, the vice president was running then, and George Bush, uh, who had you know name recognition, had a you know national standing as well. Uh, and Jack's time may have crested a little earlier in terms of the ideas Jack had, which were being embraced. And there's a timing thing here, I think, on you know, all political candidates that you know everything is the right time. Ronald Reagan may not have done as well four years later or four years earlier. Uh, I, I, I think Jack peaked when Ronald Reagan was president. Uh, had that not been the case, I think he might have had a different outcome. Uh, do you have any theories about why he, why he didn't do better? In 88? Yeah. Uh, well, um, Bush, having been vice president uh, under Reagan for eight years, had a, a distinct uh, advantage in that campaign. And I think they were able to raise the huge amounts of money com compared to what Jack was right. able to raise. And uh, it just, uh, it was too much of a handicap for Jack to uh, overcome. Uh, Tony, had you hoped in 1980 that he might, that he might have been uh, Ronald Reagan's running mate? Um, no, well, I thought that was far-fetched, but I did think that Jack should have been uh, George H.W. Bush's running mate in 88. Yeah. That would have made a much stronger ticket, and that would have been a much, um, I think, more well-rounded ticket. But remember, yeah. <clears throat> during the primary, uh, Bush had labeled the Kemp economic plan the voodoo mm -hmm. economics, so that might have been uh, a factor in Bush not picking Kemp to be the VP. But Jack was always such a positive guy. I don't think anybody who maybe have disagreed with him philosophically felt bitter towards Jack. Jack certainly didn't feel bitter towards mm -hmm. them. It's not the, cane, the same kind of uh, discourse we have today. And that's okay. the, the humorous thing about it when they accuse him of a voodoo economics. He said, well, if I'm promoting voodoo economics, uh, I'm the chief uh, witch doctor. <laughs> <laughs> um, then, then he did become the vice presidential candidate uh, under Bob Dole. Were you surprised when, when Dole picked him? Well, we were hoping it would be uh, uh, Kemp Dole, the, <laughs> the other way around. But he didn't run in 96. Why did he not no. run in 96? I don't know. I think uh, for the same reason before that, uh, uh, you know, he just wanted to make sure that there was no vacuum with the, the Reagan or the uh, tax cut policies that he was uh, promoting. Was he, when he was HUD secretary in between 88 and 92, did he maintain a connection with Buffalo? I mean, did, did Buffalo in any way benefit from his being HUD secretary? Um, he was a national figure at that point. So I, I, he, he came back to Buffalo as HUD secretary, and, um, but I don't believe that he did anything specific just because it was Buffalo. But he, it was never out of his mind that this was his second home. And, uh, but he did things for the entire country. And he, he was faced with um, a lot of difficulties right in the beginning of his term because he had to uh, uh, deal with some things that had happened in the previous administration that he needed to uh, uh, get on, taken care of before he could go forward with his ideas in the housing field. Okay, uh, summing up now, let me just ask each, each one of you, how do you think Jack Kemp should be remembered in history? Well. As a very passionate man who who will climb or educated himself from a degree in physical education to one of the leading experts on economics, and uh, his passion was uh, unrivaled. Tony, yeah, I think his passion was unrivaled. Uh, his civility was also uh, unrivaled. And I think the contributions that Jack made to the U.S. economy are tremendous. And, you know, as time goes on, I think Jack's stature has increased tremendously because, you know, we in Buffalo knew him and I don't think can fully appreciate some of the national things that occurred. And, I, I mean, when I used to go to Britain quite a bit because we sold our company to, to a British firm, 
the, the Brits were just in love with Jack. Margaret Thatcher thought the world of Jack Kemp. I met her a couple of times and when I told her I was a good friend of Jack Kemp's. Well, that, she was just so impressed with Jack. I mean, he really had a, really an international following uh, that I think as time goes on will be remembered more and more. Ed? I think uh, people would remember Jack not only as a passionate man, but a compassionate man. About a year and a half ago, I think it was when uh, Mary Lou, my wife, and I were at uh, church on uh, Sunday. It was the fourth Sunday of Easter, and the gospel was about the Good Shepherd. And uh, as far as Jack Kemp was concerned, there wasn't a person who he thought was too small or too insignificant that he wouldn't try to help, and I think that's going to be his legacy. Mary Lou? He was a, he was a good man. He was a, he was a politician. He was a football player. He was a family man. His family was so important to him. His wife, Joanne, was a rock. She was his, literally his uh, um, wind beneath his, his wings. Mm -hmm. And he, he loved that. He loved his passion for what he had, was passionate for. And he put all his energies into it. All of those uh, families, including his, uh, his football family and his staff and his constituency. And, and I think the people of Western New York, um, uh, if they really think about it, that he, they owe a lot to him because he's contributed a great deal to this community in, at many different levels. Good. One more thing, Mark. He, yep. he had great hair. <laughs> <laughs> Both of the congressmen <laughs> from that district had great hair. Paxson, <laughs> Jack Quinn, yeah. and then Reynolds came along and broke <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 <laughs> Marie, Marie brought a pretty good point up. I yeah. mean, Jack was the consummate family yeah, man, okay. and I, I really tremendously admired him and respected him for that because in Washington, he never got caught up in the trappings of, of, of mm -hmm. Washington with the, you know, going out with the lobbyists and stuff like that. If you wanted to meet with Jack, you come to his house. And, uh, you know, right. the, mm -hmm. the, the Kissingers and the Bill Bennetts would come and have dinner with Jack and Joanna mm -hmm. and the kids. and. And uh, I really admired and respected him for that. He was his own man, no question. Absolutely. Right, he, right. He, he was true to himself. He was right. true to the cause. Mm -hmm. And he, he never lost his soul. That's a good way to end it. Thank you so much for, for, for doing you. this. This is going to make a great addition to the, to the Kemp Legacy Project. Thank you all.